And so I'd love to hear from you if you could start off by describing the environment that you were born into. So the central district, the central area, most people don't really know what it was like in the 60s. Could you describe that environment? Yes, and I can describe it more so since I was born in 61, um, late 60s, early 70s. There was um, a very um, community, diverse community, and I'll say African-American community was pretty widespread in the CD. I lived on um, 15th and Jefferson, which was two blocks from Seattle University. I also lived on 18th and Jefferson, and um, my aunt lived on 28th and Norman. All of that area would be considered the central district. There were some, you know, black businesses. Um, people were working. All your neighbors, not all your neighbors were black. They were black and white. Um, and my family, um, it was just my mom that raised us. We didn't have um, a father. At one time, I had a step a stepdad, but my mom raised all six of us, and with the help of her sister, Helen Summarize. Those those are my two giants in in my um, life, and um, I get emotional now. <laughs> I'm getting emotional too early, mm -hmm. just speaking on how they raised. All six, all six of us, and all three of my cousins um, together, and we were taught to be very, very proud people. Um, the neighborhood, yeah, everybody just loved each other, played with each other. You know, you hear old stories about um, going and borrowing something from your neighbor, mm -hmm. and um, and it was like that. My mom was a great cook, so people uh, wanted to come over and eat at our house. Um, when we went on, we used to go to the zoo a lot as families. Woodland Park? Woodland Park Zoo, and it was a, a day out for the both the Summarize and the Richard families. So I had a really fun childhood um, growing up. Mm. So that environment of the CD, uh, different vibes today. Very. You don't feel those same <laughs> kind of vibes in the CD now. No, not Could at you, all. So knowing that was the kind of culture of the space and the family dynamic you were a part of, what did you want to be when you grew up? What did you think about growing up to be? I thought about being um, a lawyer uh, at one point in my life and um, or somebody that was in Congress um, doing something that had to do with law. And, of course, that stemmed from um, going to close-up and also being in law and society um, in high school. What's close-up? Close-up was a government program that was started to... Um, have high school students go to Washington, D.C. for a week and explore uh, the government. And I was allowed or um, able to go twice um, in my junior and my senior year. Mm -hmm. Wow. So you had wanted to be something like a lawyer, but you wound up being very close to that in yes. many ways, in yes. your own way, actually. That's cool. Well, can you talk a little bit about your schooling growing yes. up? Yes. I went to T.T. Um, Minor. That was my elementary school. <laughs> and then I went to uh, Madrona for, for fifth grade. Sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, I went to Eckstein Middle School, which was out in the north Ooh. end. And that was the voluntary busing. And it wasn't something that I, I was fearful about or scared because... Um, Mom said it was going to happen, and that's what I was going to do. My mother and then uh, Helen here, Nana, they um, they were very concerned about education. And I, I'll say this at least for me. I am the baby of the family, and I do feel like I got extra love or extra things poured into me, and because there's such... Um, 
a space between like me and your auntie Lori, say six years, and then even more years with all the rest that I didn't get to see what their input was with them. But when I came along, it was like all their love and all their energy was poured into me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so when I um, got bused or did the voluntary busing with Eckstein, um, I wasn't afraid or fearful. And I went there and immediately um, was comfortable. I met someone who I love to this day. Her name um, was is Miss Archibauer, Miss Joanne Archibauer. There were four teachers, Joanne Archibauer, uh, Miss Delzell, Miss Hibbler, and Miss Willis. These four (laughs) co-eds were a great part of my life, but it was Miss Archibauer who just, I mean, she poured into me her love. And um, we went places together. She took me and my friend Zelda, um, our first Chinese food, um, making us eat with chopsticks. You know, she said we couldn't have any food unless we (laughs) ate with the chopsticks. (laughs) Um, She did that. They took us to Sonic Games. She met mom. You said Sonic Games? For people that don't know what the Sonics are. The Seattle Supersonics. What's that, a a hockey team? Basketball team. Basketball team. That's in the olden days. (laughs) (laughs) So um, we would go to Sonic Games, and we just, it was a natural relationship, almost, well, you call it a mentoring relationship today, Mm. and um, we just called it love, you know, back then. And this is with one of your teachers. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. so let's go back just a little bit talking about the busing. Can you explain what that is? Because somebody might hear, oh, busing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I caught the seven. Right. You know, but that's not the same, right? Mm-hmm. So what do you mean by you were bused? Busing, you either, okay, they had schools right here in the CD. And then there were other schools that were out in the north end that is a long distance from the CD. It would cause you to have to catch one bus from the central area to downtown to Seattle, downtown Seattle, and then a second bus from downtown Seattle to the north end. I do remember also catching the school bus. Um, it must have been in the first year from um, that I caught what we called <laughs> the yellow school bus mm-hmm. <laughs> associated. Um, but then I started to catch the city buses by myself. And it was um, a long, long way because you go downtown, wait for the the number 16 um, to go out to uh, X9. Mm-hmm. So, um, but that didn't um, deter me or make me feel, oh, you know, I like I felt, I didn't feel like this is, a trip, you know, why am I having to take these two buses? I look back on it now, Mm -hmm. though, and go, why did I have to take those two buses? (laughs) Mm -hmm. But um, once I got to school, you know, be seeing my friends, being with my friends, studying, um, just trying to make the best that I could um, of myself. Mm -hmm. And I was really a good student, always have been, studied hard, worked hard, and and I'll say because of that, too, that is why different teachers, they really, they were drawn to me. And I'm not saying that in a way to, put, like, puff myself up, but because of someone that wanted to learn and was very um, intelligent, then the teachers, you know, they're, look, they're looking to you for leadership or they're looking to me for leadership. And... Um, and so in that way, it, it was just a really a good experience. So was the purpose of busing, was that did it have to do with the population? Like there's not enough room at the schools in the CD or like what was the right. what was the reason why that was even a suggestion? Okay, so it was never explained to me, mm-hmm. which is one of the things that I think could be done better is an explanation to um, not only parents, but to to the children themselves that are affected, um, whether so that they know that the purpose of you going being bused to this school is to have the best education or to have access. 
That's a word that I think is really important. It's giving us access to uh, better education. And I didn't, you know, I wasn't told that. But again, because I trusted my mom and I trusted Aunt Helen um, to do what was best for me, then I I did not question it or say, you know, why am I going, you know, I'm going to Eckstein. Why am I going out there? I knew it was about my education. And so I was comfortable in doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, would you be willing to talk a little bit about maybe what was the alternative? Because when we talk about busing and this access to better education, yes. so then um, what was the alternative? Well, I had gone to, um, like I said, to TT Minor, which was a school that I could walk to from 18th and Jefferson where I lived. I walked about six blocks to that school. And Madrona was uh, right up the hill from uh, TT Minor, and that's where I went to fifth grade. And that was a walkable school. And so for middle school, I'm sure I probably would have been maybe going to what was known as Sharpless and is now known as Aki Karosi, which is a school that you attended. Um, I would have been probably going there, Sharpless. But at, if I recall... Um, Sharpless had <laughs> bad kids or um, things that were going on. Um, and so I guess maybe that was going to be my alternative. And um, I, I wound up going to Eckstein. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I asked that because, you know, I care about those kids, you yes. know, a lot. And, um, yes. you know, when we talk about the difference in schools that get invested in schools that don't get invested right. in who gets the chance to go to those and not. And knowing that now today, it's a little more private, public charter school versus, okay, here's a mother who has a child and they want this opportunity for them to have this education. Mm -hmm. um, so shout out to Grandma Fanning. Shout out to Nana Helen, you know, who had the foresight to invest in your education. Um, can you talk a little bit about you mentioned Miss Auerbauer, Arkenbauer, Arkenbauer, Miss Arkenbauer, and how she made you feel special. Um, can you just expound a little bit more about some times within school that you felt acknowledged, you felt seen, um, and maybe even a couple of moments that stood out to you where you felt, you know, like, wow, I'm being seen for who I am in this space. Yes. Um, well, with Miss Arkenbauer, Miss um, Hibbler, Miss Willis. Uh, Miss Dalzell, um, they again they they took time with us. They um, took us on trips um, and spent quality time with us. And it extended to when when your dad and I got married in 1984. Miss Arkebauer was there. She followed up on me after I went to college. Um, and stayed a part of my life. Um, I haven't talked to her in a, in a long time, but she's someone that, um, yeah, really saw me. Another teacher from um, Lincoln High School who was responsible for just investing in me and never letting me put forth an effort that was below me was Rachel Gray. I love that woman. Um, she was very hard on me and very hard on all the students, um, she was African-American, and I'll say um, black and white, but she did not put up with any any mess. And if you weren't doing your best, like if it was a paper or something like that, you, you had to do it again. Even with me, I read some of the things that she wrote to me in two of my yearbooks, and um, one of them was that I was... <laughs> charming, intelligent, and procrastinating. Mm. And so when I said, hey, Miss Gray wrote that. And and she is the one who um, told me that if Lincoln had held back the people that couldn't read at a 12th grade level the year that I graduated, which was 1979, that there would have been maybe another half of our class mm. And she couldn't be, she couldn't solve that problem on her own, 
Um, but that that really stuck with me. Mm. Um, and when I was at Lincoln, I I felt like I was getting a good education and really focusing more on me. But I know that I had friends that weren't doing as well or were doing other things and just not really focusing on school, getting in, you know, I won't say getting in trouble, getting high and just kind of doing doing their own things. And then I was singled, not singled out, but they called Sean the goody goody um, square. Um, but they love me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but uh, it didn't influence them you know yes we gotta we gotta do this we gotta study more we gotta be like Sean but I was just trying to be an example but I wasn't gonna let what somebody else is doing um change my focus and um change that I was going to go on to college and and do bigger things Mm -hmm. so you were already committed at a young age to that Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Can can you talk about a little bit about um, some of the things that you did in school outside of school? Yes. um, Well, close up was something that um, was very important to me in the the government program. Um, I was a varsity cheerleader, and again, this was a it was a mixed school. black and white, and the year that I became a varsity cheerleader, there were two African-Americans, me and Viva, Viva Young. Viva. And we, uh, you know, we practice, we practice hard, and the whole entire school votes, votes for you. You get up and do two, two um, routines, and then all of the uh, votes are tallied and everything, they tell you later on, you know, who wins. And I had a botany teacher that I love, Mr. McDonald's, and he was the MC <laughs> when we tried out. And my lips <laughs> were quivering, shaking. I had cotton mouth by the time we were getting to the end of the second routine. And he was just going, hey, <laughs> Sean, I see you. <laughs> you know, just keep it up. <laughs> This was and the I'm just coach? yeah, he was just the MC oh. for the assembly, and I'm sitting there, you know, like with my mouth shaking and the and cotton mouth, and um, and then later that day we found out, you know, who had won, and Viva and I had worked really hard. There was another African American young lady that I tried out too, mm. and she, Janice, and she didn't make it, but mm. Viva and I um, both made it. And so we were involved in sports, going to all these different schools, cheerleading for them. Um, I was in the Black Student Union. I was in the pep club the year before when, um, and then that's how it kind of led me. I should just go for this cheerleading thing. Mm. And um, so I was always involved in something. Mm -hmm. Um, And then Law and Society, um, the Totem newspaper, um, I I worked on that one year, and I found myself um, a person that was just reconciled to, to to all people, and it was like I had all these white friends, I had all these black friends, never forgetting who I who I am and who I was as a black person, and everybody just allowed to be themselves, and so. Um, even to this day, that's just who I am. And so I had a lot of friends um, at Eckstein, then a lot of friends at Lincoln, um, white and black, and we all just did our mm. you know thing together. Yeah. I will say that um, for me, how much I loved going to school and loved Lincoln can be expressed in the fact that I went to my 10, my 20, my 30, and 40 year reunion with these same people. Oh. And I think that's that's saying a lot because a lot of people say, I don't ever want to see those people again. I don't. And mine was these friendships, and I'll say the cheerleaders like Sean McFarland, um, we were the two Shawns, so we're still friends There's now. There's only one Sean. And, <laughs> uh, and Marin Holmes, we're still friends. We lost one of our. Um, Dear cheerleaders, last year Elisa to uh, Elisa Lim mm. to cancer. Um, Carrie Scott, she passed away, 
and um, and Viva, and they're they're still my friends. And at our 40th year reunion, which was just before COVID, my friend Shannon had got up and she was speaking about all of the um, just kind of the hate and the division that was going on in our country at the time. And she was saying we we didn't have that at Lincoln. We were all just, you know, trying to make, get our education, be the best that we could be, and not holding um, each other down, calling each other names, saying that we need to be separate. Um, And so she didn't really, she couldn't grasp how the country was kind of, to us, moving backwards to this division. Yeah. Well, let's let's stick on that because, you know, in the experience of integration, uh, your experience, while folks may want to herald it as exceptional, maybe it was more common than folks thought. But let's not stray that we still live in a country that is built on principles of racism and anti-blackness. Um, so was that apparent? I know that we're talking a lot about the successes and the praises, but I also don't want us to glamorize what you experienced. And while your classmates may say, oh, we didn't have that at Lincoln, I'm sure there was a black kid at Lincoln mm-hmm. that was probably like, I don't like this. Um, and then even still today, knowing that although schools are not legally able to be segregated based on race, schools are just as segregated today as they were in the 60s, even with integration. So maybe could you talk about, are there stories of harm that was done? Maybe not to you or to folks around you, because we just do have to be careful of over glamorizing integration as, you know, knowing that we think about Ruby Bridges and that experience mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. that gets lifted up as the common experience. But then your experience, is, you know, balances that out and says, hey, there's some variety in the experience. Could you talk about maybe some of the variety and the experiences you had at Lincoln? Yeah. Well, for, first, I want to be clear that this is about my my experience um, with with um, desegregation, and and so you're not going to hear a lot of negative about mine, with the exception of um, a teacher in my link at Lincoln High School was Miss Calder, <laughs> and she gave me. We had a, a typing test that she, another girl, white girl, and I, we got the exact same score. And she gave the white girl an A, and she gave me an A minus. And I saw that, and I went home, and I told Grandma Fanny about it. I said, this is what happened. And... Grandma Fanny came to the school, um, and Burl Garnett, who was someone who looked out for a a lot of people, and he's still alive today. He's probably in his 90s. Um, He was one of the assistants. He um, talked to Miss Calder. We we talked to Miss Calder, um, and but how it was the resolution was not to give me an A but to reduce the young lady's score to an A minus. Um, was that equity? Who knows? But in her mind, she that's what she decided that she would do. And so I did. I, I, I had that experience. And, and that was the time that I said, hey, this is not fair. And I knew it wasn't. And I knew that I had people at home that were going to come and that were going to take up for me. Um, and advocate for me, mm. which is the same thing that I then wound up doing for you, for Kyla. Um, if something is going wrong, then the parents have to be involved. Who's Kyla? Kyla is my beautiful daughter, and she's 36. Okay. Um, one thing I do want to say about the um, – another thing about my schools, Eckstein and Lincoln – that at Eckstein, I had a black principal for three years, so it was Robert Gary. At um, Lincoln, black principal, Roberta Barr, Roberta Barr who um, the Centerstone has, has been named after. Centerstone is a, 
a community organization that used to be Central Area Motivation Program, very well known in the community. And that is the the lady who ran. That's who Bird Bar is named after? Yes, my principal. Wow. And I have in my collection, collection. Um, you know, letters, a letter from her when um, I was doing really well in school. Mm. And so I think that is part of um, the good experience. Um, I don't know what they did before um, as far as getting getting a plan together and saying, you know, at this school, at X time, we're going to have this many black teachers and we're going to have um, black administrators. And then at Lincoln, we're going to have a black principal, we're having black administrators. So we had, it wasn't just black and white people together, but also the administration was mixed race. And so mm. that was a good yeah. way to do things. Yeah, I'd wonder, I'd love to, for them to be in your seat and to inquire to them as well about some of their experiences being in that environment, you know, to be, I'm sure it was probably the first black principal at Eckstein, you know, mm -hmm. um, at that time. Um, yeah. So then to be under the tutelage of folks who, you know, were pioneers in their era, and then you as a scholar able to be a pioneer um, in your era, that's pretty cool. Um, are you willing to talk about maybe how those experiences prepared you for higher education. Because then you did go on to Seattle University, was it? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Seattle Which was University. a, you know, probably similar demographic yes. to Eckstein and um, Lincoln. So can you talk a little bit about how that prepared you for that next level? Yes. Um, well, when in high school, I was a member of the Honor Society, and um, I graduated cum laude from Lincoln High School. What's cum laude mean? It means I'm smart. <laughs> and <laughs> and um, I always, I, I didn't like getting grades like lower than a B. I mean, that really it would just bother me. <laughs> and so... Um, I wanted to do my best, and I really wanted to make my mom proud. I really wanted to make my mom and my Aunt Helen proud. And um, they sac sacrificed a lot for me. They didn't have a lot, but... They saw the potential in me. I guess I just really knew that I could be great. And uh, so whenever I was home, you know, I'm just hitting the books first, hitting the books first before I did anything. Hit the books, hit the books. Um, and... Actually, when I got into, even though I had graduated with honors, I don't know what it was that they were looking at at Seattle U, but when I got my acceptance letter from Seattle U, it was, um, you know, where, where they say, you're, you're getting in, but we got to see how you're going to do the first year. So that's what the letter said. And so, and then I just wound up, I graduated with honors from Seattle U as well. And when I was little, living on 15th um, and Jefferson, when we lived like about um, two blocks from Seattle U, me and my friend Curtis Dean uh, used to like skip down the hill and just go, we all go to Seattle University, Seattle University. And, you know, we were doing this when we were little, and then I wound up going to that school and um, where I met my husband, Gregory Davis, and um, it wound up being um, a great experience as well. And I do know, too, that I, and I have other friends that didn't have, again, the same experience that I had um, or may have experienced racism and everything. Um, and it's all about just that we are all human and we all have a humanity that 
everybody needs to um, treat us all the same. And and I'm sad that that doesn't happen. Um, I'm sad that people have hatred in, in their hearts or um, think that there is a difference in, in us because we have, we're a different color. And so I think if people are leading from love, leading from care, um, that all of these, the African-American families, Asian families, white families, everybody wants the best for their child. And the education, the access to the education and even access to funds for gra- gra- post graduate, meaning that they have scholarships, more scholarships available so that people like me can go to college. I mean, for the most part, I got a three hundred dollar um, scholarship that I used towards Seattle U and the rest I paid on my own. And I had a mother that was on welfare. Seattle U, you hear that? <laughs> yeah. Should have got it free. I should. I feel I feel have, like especially it. and you know, that's mm-hmm. this is me. This mm-hmm. is me playing the sun role. Mm-hmm. I'm like, mm-hmm. how you not get a full ride? Mm-hmm. And um, as we close, you know, I think about Tupac Shakur said that he was the rose that grew from concrete. Mm-hmm. Um, my friend and partner, Darzell, said she's the lotus that emerged from the mud. And um, we're celebrating you in this conversation because you overcame a lot. And people may hear the successes, they may hear the praises, the accolades, and you wear it very well, though you had to endure a lot that we didn't talk about, um, some that we did talk about. Um, but yeah, you're a lotus that emerged out the mud. You're a rose from, I'm not even going to say the concrete because our family ain't concrete, um, but they tough. And just shout out to you for that. Um, in closing, could you maybe just speak on what is the, you want the legacy of your experience to be? Um, I feel like my legacy is sitting in front of me. You, you and Kyla. And I will say that um, your dad and I, yeah, we sacrifice a lot then um, to then send you guys to private schools. Um to get the education that we felt that you two deserved um, because we saw the changes and stuff in the public schools. that it, it, We had to do what was right and best for you. So um, my legacy is to pour into you, pour into Kyla, who is also, both of you guys have made me proud. Um, they say you want your children to do better and to be better than you. And I feel that that happened with me from mom and Helen and now you and Kyla from me and from your dad and from your grandparents. And and I want to love as many young people as I can. I want to mentor um, as many young people as I can, but it's about uh, the legacy of love and the legacy of education and being your best. Amen and Ashe. Amen. Thank you for your time, Mama. Thank you. I'm going to count us down. Can I actually ask one question before we wrap? Um, Jarell, you hit on something really interesting. Um, A lot of this country does not want to engage on conversations about race. You're trying to pretend like we can't talk about these things or they didn't happen. Mm. Can you talk about why it's important that you guys share this conversation today and share this for the next generation? I'm going to let you uh, answer that, son. Hmm. My answer or asking? Um, I think I'm asking. Fine. Yeah. If you could actually I'm going to ask you. About why it's important you guys have this discussion today mm-hmm. and talk to one another. Yeah. Jarrell, why is it important that we have this conversation about education and about race at this time? Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's important that you and I have this conversation and, you know, even when they're not here, shout out to them. We, you and I talk about these things, you know, and we, we don't always agree, you know, and we, we push each other, Mm -hmm. you know, um, and I think that we actually learn from each other. Um, and I would say that's probably what I feel like is 
why it's really important that we have these intergenerational conversations that come from a place of love because we are it's, I think it's really okay to not be in agreement with everybody. Like, there's 7 billion people on earth. We ain't always going to agree to the right thing or the same thing, you know. Right. Um, but to be able to hear and listen and care about perspectives allows you allows yours to be influenced, you know. Um, and so, I feel like y'all raised me to be open-minded, yet firm in what I believe. Yes. Um, and I feel like I try to hold that balance pretty strongly. Um, and so I think it's important that you and I are having this conversation as an example of what intergenerational dialogues could look like um, and the importance of them continuing to happen. Um, and so, yeah, why do you think that it's important at this point in time for us to be having this conversation? Well, I see like when they're talking about critical race theory and things that they don't want in schools and I watched like the Little Rock Nine last night and watched Ruby Bridges and them going into the schools and to have um, people uh, just so adamant that they didn't want to be like in the same schools with us or like having them people come to school and then take their children out and the need for that narrative to never go away and to peop for people to know this is where we came from, how awful it was, and how can we do this better. And there's no reason to, um, to be afraid. It may be the way that it's framed, critical race theory, you know, what it, what it means it, it, or it scares people, the words. <laughs> but the things that black people have gone through and... Um, all that we have come from, we can never forget it. And I had a mother and I had an aunt, you know, march, march with Martin Luther King. There's no way that I'm ever going to forget it. And just because you don't like it or you say, let's stop talking about it, we're not going to stop talking about it. Um, we have to do more and we have to do better. Mm -hmm. And if I may say as well, you know, just in closing, yeah, there's, there's still a lot more to be done that we're nowhere near done. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think about our international family members, our folks who are coming from war-torn countries, um, students who speak, whose parents speak different languages so yes. they can't advocate for their child in the same way. Right. Um, and that in the 60s, maybe that dynamic wasn't as prevalent, but, you know, and, you know, I work in the schools, and so seeing that, in addition to some of the racial dynamics, still not being, you know, moved away from. So it's really important, and I'm glad that we're able to talk about it freely, yes. both on microphones and in the car or in the living room, you know, or on a walk at Blue Water, um, you know. And so let's keep these conversations going and encourage people, like you said, to lean in from love. Yes. Because that's that's what's going to keep us going. Is there anything that you would not want to close with? This is great. This has been wonderful with my son, my beautiful son. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity.